Eyewitness News. Tonight, Vincent Gigatti takes it on the chin. The jury finds him guilty of racketeering and conspiracy to commit murder. Good evening, everybody. I'm Bill Butel. It took the jury only 16 hours of deliberation to come up with a verdict. Eddie Arusa is live at the federal courthouse in downtown Brooklyn. Good evening, Eddie. Hello, Bill. But it took the federal government seven years from the time they first indicted Giganti to get to this point. Now, it's a case that some, including the judge at this trial, felt was not very strong. But it proved to be strong enough for the jurors. And come this time tomorrow, the man now found guilty of heading the Genovese crime family will be reporting to a federal prison. Vincent the Chin Giganti left his home this morning, still only the accused head of the Genovese crime family. This afternoon, he returned home a convicted mafia don. All of the old-time mob bosses are now convicted, and as of 4 p.m. tomorrow, will be in jail. After three days of deliberations, a jury of four men and eight women found Giganti guilty on all six federal counts brought against him. The charges included racketeering and conspiracy to murder John Gotti. The jurors, however, said the government did not prove that Giganti was responsible for seven gangland murders, which formed part of one of the racketeering charges. He has embarked on a determined crusade to elude prosecution. His charade was finally brought to an end. That charade, say the feds, is the mental illness that Giganti's family says he suffers from and which has led him to often walk the streets in his bathrobe and house slippers. His lawyers also say Giganti understood nothing of the trial, including today's verdict. Uh, Mr. Giganti uh, has been and remains uh, mentally ill and incapable of assisting in his defense. In the three and a half week trial, the defense called no witnesses, believing the government's case weak. That case consisted mainly of surveillance audio tapes on which the chin is referred to but never heard, and the testimony of 12 law enforcement agents and six mob turncoats, including the notorious Sammy the Bull Gravano. The government uh, produced uh, a mountain of hearsay that I don't believe any one of us uh, would ever want to have to confront in any serious matter that related to our own personal lives. After the verdict, Judge Jack Weinstein rejected a defense request to remand Giganti to his family pending competency tests. Instead, he ordered the 69-year-old to report to a North Carolina federal prison by tomorrow. Giganti's family, often vocal throughout the trial, left without any comment. There are currently efforts to help those kids cope with their fears and their uncertainties. Eddie Arusa has more from Oklahoma City. Just blocks from the Murrah Federal Building stands the Emerson Alternative School, and it was close enough on Wednesday morning to feel the blast. Window panes shattered and students ran for cover. Hardest hit was a daycare center behind the school where toddlers like Sierra Draper also became victims of the terror attack. Glass was flying everywhere. It was on their hair and their, and their face and their arms. At Oklahoma City schools today, counselors and teachers tried to make sense of Wednesday's attack, but it was hard to explain. Mrs. Rearson's kindergarten class at Nichols Hills Elementary had a lot of questions. I was thinking, but why did they have to do it in Oklahoma City? But she did the best to reassure them. She's telling us about um, all the kids who have been um, hurt very badly and um, all about how they're going to be okay. But perhaps the hardest task was here at Feed the Children, an agency that's used to sending relief overseas has now been forced to turn its attention to its own backyard. As dozens of volunteers took in supplies of food and clothing, others handled donations to bury the dead children of the blast. The reality of it all still eluding most. If you put a blindfold on me and turned me around three times and showed me a picture of what's right behind us, and ask me where it was, I'd say Bosnia, because I've been there twice in the last couple of years. I can't believe that I'm in Oklahoma City doing what I'm doing. In Oklahoma City, Eddie Arusa, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Versace once said he liked to take wealth and throw it in your face. Eddie Arusa joins us live at Versace's Upper East Side townhouse with more. Eddie? Diana, like every other major fashion designer, Versace had a base here in New York, his townhouse here and an emporium on Madison Avenue that today was closed for all except his most faithful customers. But unlike every other designer, Versace went where none had gone before, leaving a legacy that some say cannot be overestimated. Versace was one of the 
about five or six most important designers at the end of the 20th century. And some feel that the best of Versace was yet to come. But in what he created during his 25-year career, the designer forever revolutionized the industry and the modern way of dress. He really led the way. If he could do it, why can't we? And so we would then go and, and, and try to meet the competition, which, which he set. He set a pace. What distinguished Versace from others were his colors and fabrics, which included metal mesh, vinyl, even rubber fused with lace. For women, his creations were sexy and form-fitting. For men, he combined the linen jacket with a t-shirt, which became the rage when it was popularized in the hit TV show, Miami Vice. The word most often used to describe his style was flamboyant, but some of his critics preferred the word vulgar. Versace denounced that, saying he wasn't creating for the critics. I think that is the appeal of Versace. It's not for the boring people, that's for sure. He dressed the rich and famous, among them Elizabeth Hurley, Madonna, and Elton John. He was the first to take magazine fashion models, such as Naomi Campbell, and turn them into supermodels on his runways. His shows were part Hollywood glitz, part rock events. At New York's Fashion Institute of Technology, design students speak of his influence. Versace, just to see his work, to know that it was okay to be creative, and just to see that. And I think that really made an impact on me. His fame brought him fortune along with a palatial home in Italy, a 16-room townhouse on the Upper East Side, and the mansion in Miami. Just last week, the 50-year-old designer unveiled his latest collection in Paris. He also recently overcame a bout with cancer, and friends say he was looking forward to a rest. Everything I saw around me inspired me. I'm a dreamer, and my dreams come true. Versace's sister Donatella was with him in the business. She headed his Versus line, and it is speculated that she will now head the company. We're live on the Upper East Side, Eddie Arusa, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Sadly, no amount of prayers could save the Great Joy Baptist Church in Bushwick. After part of it collapsed, city officials decided the rest of the church would have to be brought down. Eddie Arusa is live at the scene tonight with more. Eddie? Sarah, just take a look behind me and you'll see that the Great Joy Baptist Church is no more. It took the city only a couple of hours to demolish it tonight after a day of fears that it might come down on its own. Now, built in 1896, for the last 25 years, it's been the spiritual home to a small and poor congregation, but they are rich in faith, and it is that that is sustaining them tonight. With tears welling up in his eyes, the pastor of the Great Joy Baptist Church looked on as a giant claw gradually brought down the house of worship he headed. For him, it was a scene of great heartbreak. We had just laid a brand new yard, brand new fence, and we was on our way to renovate the inside and the outer uh, body of the church. But for fire and city building officials, it was something of a relief that they could demolish the 101-year-old church in bits and pieces. Throughout the day today, they insisted it was on the brink of total collapse. Tin ceiling had pulled down the plaster and the beams. And with that, with the beams coming down, the sidewall on the exposure fourth side, that's the right side of the building, had sort of turned inwards and outwards. The wind, if we had high wind right now, could pull, it, pull the building right down. The old church started crumbling on its own shortly before noon when its second floor ceiling collapsed. Inside a ground floor office at the time were five church officials holding a business meeting. Jeanette Lynn was walking in when she says she heard something that sounded like an earthquake. It was a big rumble. You know, and then you heard, then you heard something falling down, then you heard, just seeing smoke. You know, a lot of dust, I guess the dust was coming up. And what did you do? I ran. And so did the church folk inside. They were not hurt. Fire officials arrived and declared the structure dangerously unsound. They began evacuating residents from nearby homes. Tonight, they brought in the heavy equipment to complete the job that they think rotting wood started. We can speculate that because the roof is in such disrepair and the age of the church, that uh, possibly the roof had been leaking for a while, causing a wet rot inside. Some of the 125 church members said that while they may have lost their church, it has not shaken their faith. The only thing we can do now is pray and ask to help us to rebuild the church. So just how is the going out there at the moment? Well, Eddie Arusa has been sampling some spots in New Jersey, and he joins us live tonight from Sayreville. Eddie? Well, Sarah, it looks like it's going to be a long night for road crews throughout central Jersey, and as you can see at this hour, the snow continues to barrel down. 
and accumulate here in Sayreville. And at this public works yard, the salt trucks keep coming in to fill up at a 500-ton salt pile that you see behind me. Now, for this, as you said, is the first major snowstorm of this season to wallop much of our area. But for many who remember where we were at this point last year, this really doesn't seem that bad. Salt trucks, which sat mostly idle throughout today, were put into action tonight as the snow started covering Route 36 in Monmouth County. The trucks and plows were out in force. The borough of Sayreville mobilized its small fleet at around 6 o'clock. Currently, we have nine trucks out, including in, uh, including this payloader, and we'll probably be out until around 2, 3. It all depends as to uh, how cold it gets tonight. But for much of today, the only accumulation was on grassy areas. Although along the Jersey Turnpike, signs warned of snow and slick roads, the only thing covered were signs. The storm caught many by surprise. I understood that there was going to be a little bit of a dusting, but... Uh... I think all the weathermen were probably wrong. Along parts of the Jersey Shore, two to four inches had piled up by mid-afternoon, but kids didn't seem to mind, doing what snow beckons kids to do. One 10-year-old, however, says this weather can be hazardous for him. Oh, it snows fine, except sometimes you get your tongue stuck to poles, and I really like that. For adults, the real hazard of slippery roadways increased tonight, and some were preparing in case things got really bad. Well, the back roads were pretty slick because of the snow starting to stick to them, but the highway was okay. It was just wet, but I know it's going to freeze later, so that's why I went to the store now. But for those who still recall last year's blizzard and the seemingly endless string of storms that followed it, today's burst of winter didn't seem so bad. In fact, in many areas, it was even downright pretty. I like the snow, so I'm happy. <laughs> Now, while the salt trucks are out there doing their job on the primary street, some of the side streets that we rode on were not clear at all, and the covering uh, was pretty thick, and the roads were slick. So if you don't have to head out tonight, don't. And if you're heading out tomorrow, they still might be covered, so be careful as you head out there. We're live in Sayreville, Eddie Arusa, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. It's unconventional, some might even say unorthodox, but the members of St. Paul and St. Andrew Methodist Church call it entirely appropriate. Every Good Friday for the last three, congregants of the Upper West Side Church have taken an eight-foot wooden cross on the subway to Times Square. Starting there, they recall the final hours of Christ's life. We thought it was a poignant spot. It's also the crossroads of the world where a lot of different cultures and peoples come together. Through the noise and commotion of Midtown, about two dozen faithful made their way uptown tonight, recreating the way of the cross. It's kind of a search for what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, a Christian, so we're I'm glad to do it. At points along the way, the group reflected on Christ's final journey. A stop in Central Park recalled Jesus' anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane. Martin Luther King Jr. High School served as the site of Christ's trial. Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? We see Martin Luther King Jr. as somebody who tried to embody truth and tried to speak the truth, even though sometimes it led him to... Um, betrayal and denial and, and ultimately to death. Over the last several years, the way of the cross has taken an ironic twist at its end. That's because as the Methodist congregants return to their church, they're met by a Jewish congregation that is currently sharing their sanctuary. They're members of the B'nai Jeshurun Temple. Six years ago, when the roof of their synagogue caved in, their Methodist neighbors offered them space. Never, they say, have Good Friday and Shabbat resulted in a collision of faiths. Everybody gets together. I mean, Jews help out Christians, Christians help out Jews. It's phenomenal. On the Upper West Side, Eddie Arusa, Channel 7 Eyewitness News.